Our first reading is from the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 16 to 24. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. God, as we begin to ponder your word today, we ask that you would restore in us an insight and a hope for the faith that you have planted in us. I want you to listen to this recording for a few moments. The sound of constant dripping, enough to send the most tranquil person insane. In fact, it is something that has been used as a torture device. I can understand that. The bath in my old bathroom had a shower head above my head where I lay in the bath. It would drip. If I wanted a relaxing bath, I had to wrap the shower head in a towel to absorb the drips because otherwise the dripping would drive me mad. And of course, dripping like that is unceasing. It just never gives up. It puts me in mind of that person you may know who never stops talking. They're nice and they mean well, but really, you just want to sit and be quiet for a while. <sighs> the thought occurred that unceasing has something of a negative connotation in my mind. It obviously doesn't need to be negative. The endless swell of the ocean, the always cycle of the seasons, the constant beating of my heart until one day it doesn't. These are good things. But what about the seemingly unceasing conflict of nations? Or the grinding poverty of some that never seems to leave us? I think... My discomfort comes from the fact that I have, for a long time now, abhorred absolutes. I like the fact that black is black and white is white, but with few exceptions, they are best used sparingly. Bright colour, pastel colour, rainbow colour, all flecked with whites and blacks and greys. But when people are forced into fitting one particular view of the world, it damages them. Take a simple example. Imagine every young person in Nuomaru was told they had to become a farmer. No matter the interest or abilities, farming was what they were to do. How healthy do you think that would be? Or imagine every person over the age of 75 being told they had to move into single room apartments and rest homes, no matter their physical or mental condition, no matter whether they were married or single. How healthy would that turn out to be? 
We all know from experience that absolutes like that just don't work. Yet we secretly store them up in our minds. Nobody should be on, on an unemployment benefit. No one should ever have an abortion. Anyone who commits a crime should be locked up. If you don't work, you don't eat. Always there are exceptions. Sometimes there are more exceptions than the rule itself. Because absolutes don't work. Even absolute zero is aspirational and physically can't, cannot ever be reached. Then we come to our reading. An absolute. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. I've heard many people attempt to justify this by explaining all manner of approaches to prayer and how we might feel and express ourselves. But we all know the truth is that no one prays without ceasing. No one is always rejoicing. There are times in our lives when rejoicing is perhaps the furthest thing from our minds as we grieve over lost love or lost opportunity. I'm very sure that we don't pray while we're asleep. And I suspect that when we're deeply focused on a task, most of us aren't praying then either. Even giving thanks in all circumstances can be a stretch. Sure, we may look back on a difficult time, see God walking beside us and give thanks. But in the moment, mm, maybe not so much. What then do we do with this? I think we take a step back and realize that sometimes absolutes are used for effect. In this case, Paul is speaking to a group of people who are under the hammer. They're poor, they're on the fringes of society, and they have few resources of any kind. They've had people come and tell them all sorts of stories in an effort to get them to follow some brand or belief. They had probably met the circumcisers and the law keepers. There were likely some who told them they couldn't be Christian unless they spoke in tongues. Perhaps some who carefully explained they couldn't eat this food or associate with that person. Paul uses absolutes to make a point and draw their focus away from all these distractions. He would have known better than most that rejoicing doesn't always come easily or in every circumstance. That praying without ceasing was an aspiration, not a practical way of being. He also knew that rejoicing, praying and giving thanks are excellent food for the soul, giving sustenance when everything else seems grim and hopeless. So the pray without ceasing, rejoice always and give a thanks in every circumstance was an encouragement to look beyond the hopelessness of now and see that God was and still is in control. Our second reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith, therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. 
It may seem a little strange for me to have titled the message Creating is Unceasing, when I'm clearly not fond of the idea of unceasing. If I don't like absolutes, then why am I using an absolute? To an extent, it is in a similar vein to Paul's use of absolutes. None of us can sustain constant creation. We simply don't have the resources to do so. Unfortunately, human nature being what it is, there's a constant temptation to yield to the idea that if I can't do it, nah, I won't even try. There is, however, another way of looking at things. What if I was to tell you that unceasing creation is not only possible, it's normal. It's only absolute in the sense that it never ceases. For much of it, we don't even have to think about it. I'm going to use a rather cheeky example here, and then I'm going to build on that as we go. Who here likes breathing? Has anyone ever managed to stop breathing for an extended period of time, say, oh, no, five minutes? It's a silly question, right? Stop breathing for five minutes, and you have likely stopped breathing permanently. The thing about breathing is that we take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide. We are creating a new compound without even being aware of the chemical process that is going on in our bodies. That's unceasing creating right there. I think this is in part reflected in the lives of the birds in the air who neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet God continues to feed them. There's a beautiful pattern to this unceasing creating we see all around us that reflects what is constantly happening in our own lives. What about more conscious creating? Now, every act of living is creative in nature, taking something and turning it into something else. Some wood to make a chair, some wool to make a jersey, some food to make a meal, some time to make a friend. Everything we do is part of a creating process. And then we can dig a little deeper again. Moving from things that we have to do to live to things we choose to do. There are very few people who would claim to have no hobbies. Even those few will have things they do in their day that change the world a little or a lot. Perhaps you play bowls or collect stamps. Does anybody do that anymore? Maybe you do the daily crossword or take your dog out for a walk every day. Whatever it is you do, there is creativity going on in all of it. Here's the kicker for me. None of it requires that we worry about it. Being co-creators with God doesn't require us to worry about what we will eat or drink or wear. All that is necessary is for us to seek God's kingdom and the other things will follow. How do we do that? Well, by rejoicing when we can, praying when we remember, and being thankful as often as possible. When we do that, God steps in and fills in the missing parts. It's like Peter walking on the water. He couldn't actually walk on water. His job was to get out of the boat and start walking so that God could keep him on the surface. Miracles don't come out of us doing what we can do. They happen when we step out to do what we can't do and trust God to do the rest. And that is how creating can be unceasing. We do what we can and trust God to fill our gaps. We pray. Unceasing God, even you took a break on the seventh day. Your creativity turned from building stars and raising mountains to resting in the light of your word. We are often tired we wrestle with the things of life and wonder if we've achieved anything much at all. And you invite us to come and rest a while with you, to create as we can and allow you to fill our gaps. Help us to place our worries in your boundless arms and learn to rejoice and pray and be thankful as often as we can. Then watch 
as our puny efforts at co-creating are multiplied by your glorious grace and mercy. Amen.